to talk about is what day it should happen on or who's going to vote for it or who isn't. The, um, uh, but we are never a follower of fashion in the Resolution Foundation. So, sorry, Richard. Um, uh, so we're not going to talk about elections. We're going to talk about fiscal rules instead. Um, but there is a not very tenuous link between the two. The first is that uh, we haven't really got any rules right now, as we'll come on to in a second. And that is our view is a bad idea in general. It is definitely a bad idea as you head into election season. One of the things you find out in elections is they are expensive, the, um, as we are definitely about to find out over the next few months. The, um, uh, the second is that, slightly more worthily, that rules and fiscal rules, although they are things that fiscal wonks like to talk about, are also quite a good way for understanding what parties are offering. Rather than focusing on the individual bits of policy or the micro, they give you an insight into the strategy of what the government or the prospective government is actually trying to achieve big picture. And so they are useful if you're going into an election to have a clear sense of what people are actually going to do. We may or may not get that from the two parties ahead of uh, this election. Now, the task this morning is, first of all, um, uh, because we're not standing for election, but we do have some fiscal rules to propose. Um, Richard Hughes here, who is a research associate at the Resolution Foundation, previously director of fiscal policy at the Treasury, and also done lots of jobs at the IMF and other things, is going to set out some of the context to our thinking and then the specific rules we propose. Um, then we're going to hear from Karen Ward, who is chief market strategist at JP Morgan uh, and was previously the chair of Council of Economic Advisors in the Treasury about what she thinks about fiscal rules. The, um, and then we're going to hear from Chris Giles, who is the FT's economic editor since 2004. Since then we have had five sets of fiscal rules. They have all gone very well. The, um, uh, and then we're going to have time for some discussion and questions from the audience. So, Richard, over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Torsten, and good morning, everybody. Uh, this paper is the culmination of a trilogy we've been working on here in the Resolution Foundation on fiscal rules in the UK. It's also been very much a collaborative effort uh, on the part of the Resolution Foundation's new macroeconomic policy unit. Um, and so I, I first wanted to take a moment to thank my co-authors, Jack Leslie, who did all the macroeconomic modeling underpinning the stress tests that you'll see in the paper. Kara Pachiti, who's the first person in history to ever forecast the UK's public sector balance sheet. And James Smith, who's not only a brilliant macroeconomist, uh, but also a really wonderful colleague. Let me start by just setting up the context for this paper. Um, the UK was a pioneer in the development of fiscal rules when we first adopted them back in the late 1990s. Since then, we've had five different fiscal regimes in the last 20 years. Um, they've all included a, ta a target for the level or trajectory of debt. Um, and they've also all included a target for some variant of the balance, depending on the economic priorities of the government of the day. The lifespan of these five different rules has ranged from 10 years for Gordon Brown's golden rule to less than one year for Gordon Brown's surplus target uh, set in 2015. And the average shelf life of fiscal rules has definitely been declining over time for reasons that we explore in a, in a moment. The current set of rules set by Philip Hammond three years ago reached their sell-by date next year in 2021, but have probably, all, probably already gone off. The Chancellor bequeathed his successor this famous £27 billion uh, in headroom against his 2% of GDP structural borrowing target uh, when he left office uh, in 20, after the 2019 spring statement. Unfortunately, a combination of ONS data revisions, a deterioration in the economic and fiscal outlook over the last few months, um, and a £13 billion increase in departmental spending announced as part of the 2019 spending round has probably more than exhausted that headroom uh, against the 2% target, and which is now uh, on track to be broken. Uh, the new Chancellor has announced an intention to review the fiscal framework ahead of the next budget, and this paper sets out our proposals for what they think that they should be. But before we talk about what rules might make sense today, we thought we should first talk about what lessons we might learn from two decades of experience with fiscal rules, both here in the UK, um, but also in the other 90 countries who operate some kind of rule-based fiscal policymaking framework around the world. And a companion paper entitled Britannia Waves the Rules identifies 20 lessons uh, from UK and international experience with fiscal rules. You'll be pleased to know I'm only going to summarize three of those lessons uh, today, um, as they are particularly relevant to the rules which we go on to, to present as our proposals. The first lesson from experience is, is what gets excluded gets exploited um, in the world of fiscal rules. Um, we've had relatively comprehensive fiscal rules in the UK in terms of institutional coverage. They cover the whole of the public sector, uh, not only central governments, but also local governments. 
um, and also public corporations, so any companies that local governments or, or central government owns or controls. They're also fairly comprehensive in terms of the coverage of flows. They cover not just cash, but also accrued revenue and expenditure. But that's, that's been less the case when it comes to stocks, um, which where our fiscal rules have tended to focus almost exclusively on, on debt, um, which has encouraged increasingly in, ingenious and also poor value for money ways of getting liabilities off the government's balance sheet, including in the form famously of, of PFI contracts um, in the late 2000s and 1990s. And you can see from the chart here that the Labour government's adoption of a target for public sector net debt um, as one of their fiscal rules back in 1997 fueled a boom in PFI projects over the late 90s um, and 2000s because the liabilities uh, were not recognised in the measure of debt that the government was targeting. However, once the ONS decided to start classifying these debt-like obligations into public sector net debt starting in 2006, the appeal of this mode of financing fell off rapidly, and you can see that reflected in the winding down in the number of PFI projects over the latter half uh, of, of the first decade of, of this century. A second lesson is that rules can be too focused on the past to set the right signals about what fiscal policy should be in the present. And a good example of this was Labour's Golden Rule, um, set back in 1997, which required the government to balance the current budget over the economic cycle. And this was a period which had a certain amount of variable, variable geometry at the time, um, but at, at, the, at the time it was measured toward the end, toward the end of the uh, period, started in 1997 and ended in 2009. And the problem with a rule like this um, is that it enabled the government to take advantage of current surpluses that they ran in the late 1990s to run increasingly pro-cyclical policy um, as they moved into the mid to late 2000s. And as you can see from the chart here, which plots the fiscal stance, measured as a cyclically adjusted primary balance against the output gap, Labor, Labor's fiscal policy started out in the right-hand quadrant being relatively counter-cyclical, um, but then they took, they took advantage of those surpluses run during that period to actually run um, increasingly pro-cyclical policy, loosening, loosening fiscal policy um, as, the, as the economy was running uh, too hot in the late 2000s. And as a result, the UK entered the 2008 financial crisis in a much more structurally vulnerable position um, than had we just aimed to run current surpluses in any given year. But fiscal rules can also be too focused on the future to effectively constrain fiscal policy today. And a good example of this was the coalition government's target to balance the structural current budget over a rolling five and then three year horizon. And as you can see from the purple lines plotted on this chart, the rolling nature of that target allowed the government to repeatedly push back the day of reckoning with each successive forecast from 2013 to 2014 to 2017. And indeed, we only actually reached the structural current balance last year. So these kind of manana rules can actually mean that you never actually reach um, your intended fiscal objectives. A final lesson of the past is that chancellors consistently underestimate how much of a margin for error they need to build against their fiscal plans if they want to stand a reasonable chance of actually meeting their fiscal rules. And the two charts here show on the, on the left hand side the headroom or degree of overachievement that each chancellor since 2010 has set aside against his fiscal rules when they were first set. And those rules were typically set over, over a three to five year horizon. And on the right hand side, the average forecast error for borrowing in the pre and post OBR era. Now, the most amount of headroom that any chancellor has ever set aside against his fiscal targets was 1% of GDP in headroom set aside by Philip Hammond against his 2% of, of GDP structural balance target back in 2016. And that's between half and a quarter of the amount of headroom which is actually needed to cope with the actual degree of uncertainty involved in trying to forecast the public finances five years ahead, even after the creation of the OBR, which has helped to improve the credibility of our forecast dramatically. Now, in addition to learning uh, lessons from the past in designing the next set of fiscal rules, we also need to be cognizant of changes in the macroeconomic environment, which will mean that the past will not be exactly like the future. And one of the most commented upon changes these days is the fall in nominal interest rates to historic lows, and in some countries, even into negative territory. And this poses important challenges for, ma for macroeconomic policy, as it constrains the ability of monetary policymakers to respond to any future recessions. And it also means that fiscal policy will need to play a much more substantive, active, and durable role in stabilizing the economy in the event of future economic downturns. Now, the low interest rate environment obviously poses not only challenges, but also presents opportunities for fiscal policy, not least to tackle the problem highlighted on the right, which is the steady decline in productivity growth among advanced economies in recent years. And there is a growing chorus of economists around the world calling on governments to make use of this window of opportunity provided by low interest rates 
to borrow to invest to kickstart growth uh, across advanced economies. And that brings me on to my third and final change in the macroeconomic environment, which is the growing use of public sector balance sheets as an instrument of fiscal policy. This was most evident during the global financial crisis, which saw both sides of the UK's public sector balance sheet explode, with assets trebling and liabilities more than doubling um, in the wake of the 2008 crisis, as a result of the Treasury's efforts to rescue troubled financial institutions at the height of the crisis, and later by the Bank of England's attempts to rekindle economic growth in its aftermath through its quantitative easing operations. But the use of the government balance sheet has not been limited to these macroeconomic purposes. Over the last decade, the UK has made active use of loans, guarantees, and other financial instruments to achieve an array of microeconomic goals, including expanding access to higher education, helping first-time buyers get a foot on the housing ladder, and financing major infrastructure projects. And none of these interventions are actually captured by traditional debt measures or borrowing measures uh, that feature in UK fiscal frameworks. So with that as background and motivation, let me come on to the three rules that we propose in our paper. The first rule and the stock anchor in our framework is an objective to increase public sector net worth between now and 2024-25. This has a number of advantages over public sector net debt, which has angered every UK fiscal framework since 1998. It's a more comprehensive measure of the financial sustainability of the public sector. It covers the whole range of the public sector's two trillion in assets and four trillion pounds worth of liabilities. It captures both sides of the borrow to invest equation because rather than excluding investment from the framework, it explicitly recognizes the value and quality of the assets created or acquired through that investment. And it fully and transparently accounts for loans, asset sales, nationalizations, and quantitative easing and other sources of what the OBR uh, term fiscal illusions. The second rule and the principal flow objective in our framework is a target to keep the structural current balance within a range of plus one to minus one percent of GDP over a five-year horizon. Now the advantage of this as a flow target over the current framework is that it would, would allow government to borrow to invest, but require tax revenues to broadly cover the government's day-to-day -day running costs. The fact that it's cyclically adjusted allows the full operation of the automatic fiscal stabilizers. And the 2% of GDP target range is roughly equal to the OBR's five-year forecast error and avoids the disruptive fine-tuning characterized by, the, by past point targets, which required governments to hit particular numbers in particular years. And by targeting the top end of the range of around 1% of GDP would help the government to build up policy space to respond to economic downturns and prevent net worth from deteriorating over time uh, as successive recessions hit the UK economy. Our third rule is a requirement to keep the share of government revenue spent on debt interest below 10% at all times. And like the debt rules that have featured in UK fiscal frameworks in the past, this rule ensures that any additional borrowing allowed under the two previous rules remains sustainable. But it has a number of advantages over traditional debt to GDP ratios. First, it's a better measure of the burden that that debt actually places on the public finances, as it takes account not only of the volume of debt, but also its cost and the government's ability to service it. And you can see from the, from the chart on the right-hand side that those two things can, can diverge quite considerably for extended periods of time, including over the past decade, where our level of debt uh, has more than doubled. But actually, the burden that debt interest poses on our public finances has remained broadly the same because of falling interest rates over the same period. Second, it enables policy to gradually adjust to changes in interest rates, debt stocks, inflation, um, or, or growth, thanks to the long average maturity of, of the UK's debt. And finally, it facilitates uh, the coordination of fiscal and monetary policy because it would require fiscal policy to tighten as interest rates rise and vice versa. The final element in our proposed framework is an escape clause, which suspends the first two rules when there's a negative output gap of more than minus 1% and bank rate is below 1.5%. This allows discretionary policy to support economic activity when monetary policy is constrained. And unlike previous escape clauses, which suspended the whole framework uh, forever, only the net worth and the current balance rules will be suspended and only in the years for which the output gap would be uh, larger than minus 1%. And the debt interest ceiling would remain in force at all times. So the whole framework doesn't self-destruct when the clause is triggered, as has been the case uh, in previous frameworks, which included these kind of clauses. And moreover, the five-year time frame for meeting the rules is reset when the output gap 
closes to below minus 1%, and that allows fiscal policy to, re to return gradually to more neutral settings without undermining the economic recovery. Now, any new set of rules, including our own, um, is going to have to survive a period of unprecedented economic uncertainty. So the final section of our paper subjects them to a series of stress tests to illustrate their resilience to a range of different kinds of economic shocks. We look at four different scenarios, a baseline scenario based on the OBR's latest economic and fiscal outlook published uh, back in March, a secular stagnation scenario, which assumes persistent low growth in real GDP and, and, low in and continued low interest rates, a cyclical recession scenario representing a typical demand-led UK recession, and a no-deal Brexit scenario, which assumes that the UK leaves the EU without a withdrawal agreement and combines uh, both a demand and a supply shock. Neither of the government's current rules would survive contact with any of the three stress scenarios, um, illustrating the need for a framework to build in greater flexibility to cope with a range of, of potential economic futures. The government's 2% target uh, is broken by 2021-22 under the three scenarios, and, and debt rises um, over, over the forecast horizon in all three of the scenarios, the stress scenarios as well. In our framework, net worth uh, declines under all three of the stress scenarios in the first two years, especially after taking account of any fiscal stimulus packages uh, included in, which are included in the recession and Brexit scenario. So we model not just the scenario, the impact of the scenario on the public finances, but we also look at what happens if the government puts together a fiscal stimulus package to support the economy uh, through that period and offset some of the impact on demand. But in both cases, the escape clause is triggered, which resets the clock on these targets and, give the, and gives the government until 2026-27 to increase net worth from the moment the output gap shrinks below the level uh, that triggers the escape clause. And the modest fiscal consolidation of around 1% of GDP um, that re is required beyond the end of the forecast horizon to make sure that net worth uh, returns to, to being higher um, than it was uh, five years previously when the, when the shock had abated. And on the right-hand side, you can see that the, that the current balance remains within the target range of plus or minus 1% of GDP um, and is on track to deliver current surpluses needed to meet the net worth objective uh, by the end of the new five-year deadline. The debt interest revenue ceiling remains in force throughout this period, and it only gets close to the 10% threshold in the Brexit scenario, where increases in RPI inflation imported into the UK as a result of the devaluation in sterling push up the cost of index-linked debt. And on the right-hand side just shows our efforts to stress to the limit um, the, uh, uh, that target over a five-year forecast horizon, which would actually require a two-standard deviation shock to both inflation and interest rates, or gilt rates to hit 10% uh, for the rule to actually be breached over a five-year forecast horizon. And this is thanks to the long average maturity of, of UK government debt. However, it's important to bear in mind that it only takes gilt rates at 4%, which is where they were uh, back in 2008, and enough time for this ratio to reach 10% in the fullness of time because the government's got a tax to GDP ratio of roughly 40%. So the, these are our proposed fiscal rules to take us into the next decade. And let me conclude by acknowledging uh, that a number of the elements included within it are novel and untested in this or any other country. But at the same time, the UK has long been a pioneer in the design of fiscal rules and the development of leading age practices in fiscal policy. And if established practices in the design and implementation of fiscal rules were sufficient, we wouldn't be on our fourth set of fiscal rules in five years. So the remaining question to be asked is, is it worth all the effort to get from here to there? And when I look at the fiscal policy debate in the UK and in other countries, I worry less about the costs and risks of adopting a framework like this and worry more about the risks of not doing it. And that's because there is a growing gulf between the way our politicians think, talk about, and make fiscal policy, and the indicators we use to actually judge their fiscal performance. With interest rates at historic lows and turning negative in more and more countries, political leaders on both sides of the ideological spectrum in this country are calling for a surge in debt finance investment in physical, human, or social capital, which, they assert, should pay for themselves in the long run. However, our traditional set of fiscal rules rooted in deficits and debt do not provide a basis for judging the credibility of these promises. This is because they only capture one side of the borrowing to invest equation. And this growing gap between stated fiscal aims and measured fiscal reality risks degrading the political salience of fiscal rules on the one hand and allowing politicians to evade fiscal accountability on the other. And so in my view, the marginal administrative costs associated with improving the frequency and quality of balance sheet data and learning how to forecast these aggregates 
are dwarfed by the benefits of having a more informed discussion of the alternative fiscal strategies currently being posited on both sides of the political spectrum. And given the scale of UK the UK balance sheet, with assets of over £2 trillion and liabilities of over £4 trillion, the modest effort required to get from here to there is almost certainly worth it. And with that, I look forward to the discussion, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Richard. Right, Karen, over to you. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to talk less about specifics and more about some general 40,000 thoughts, which um, I, I thought about much more deeply when I was at the Treasury than I ever had um, it before. I think the first one is, you know, what are the rules for? I suppose when I went into the Treasury, I, having had a background purely just being in financial markets, like the rules to me were designed to uh, generate credibility to financial um, investors around the world, to demonstrate the government was committed to a sustainable balance sheet, um, had sensible policies, would not let debt um, explode or bloat, uh, and therefore it was very much about that signal to the rest of the world. Um, it became very clear that actually there's a the secondary very, uh, purpose, which is actually an internal constraint about how the government manages never-ending competing uh, demands for cash from different departments and how it places some constraint around the overall envelope in order to decide on those allocations. And I think uh, if we just look at where we are today, um, that really is the primary function of the rules. You know, ne since uh, quantitative easing and central banks um, desire to uh, fund a, a higher level of government spending because of their needs to um, try and get past issues with the zero lower bound and quantitative easing, you know, it really has, I think, in many ways, taken away the financial pressure in the global capital markets that governments may tend to have found themselves under. So I think, you know, the rules purpose these days are about um, what is the political messaging that a government wants to send about its attitude towards debt. And then um, within that envelope, you know, how is it going to allocate across departments? So I think that's an important element of the consideration of the, um, the design is, is how much does it just merely want to constrain the overall pot. Um, with regards to the, the best design, I mean, exactly as, uh, uh, as Richard alluded to, I think th the biggest challenge is having something that is rigid and provides a constraint on the envelope such that you can very clearly say, well, there's no money for that project. Um, at the same time, has the flexibility such that fiscal policy can be used and can cope with different shocks. And that's very, very difficult to get that balance. Um, I quite like the idea of somehow linking it to some sort of external signal. So whether that's, you know, the Bank of England's judgment by, you know, where, where bank rate is, but some escape clause that's not determined internally adds a little bit of credibility to that. But it's, it's very difficult to work out always what those specific escape clauses should look like. Um, and then I think the other major thing, the major challenge is, is, you know, as you say, whether any type of spending should be exempt. So is there any type of debt that's virtuous, that's valid? Um, and this is where, you know, talking about assets, I think where I become a little bit uncomfortable. So the idea, you know, we've, we've often heard when we've been discussing fiscal rules that maybe capital spending should be exempt because as long as you're spending on investment that's going to generate future growth and future tax revenues, that's going to pay for itself. So that's the kind of spending and debt that's okay. That sounds great. <laughs> that's a very clear, um, reasonable thing to say. The difficulty is then when you start to put a definition on that capital spending. So is it, um, is it, is it an infrastructure railway that's going to generate GDP and you know, increased movement of goods and transactions between two cities? Well, maybe that's investment. Is it a teacher's salary where a well-motivated teacher is going to focus on, you know, having a really highly educated um, student that's then going to go out and get a great job and, and therefore have higher income taxes? Is that investment? It becomes really hard, I think, to actually cleanly categorise what investment is. And that's why I, I, I was always very... 
concerned and cynical about um, excluding something based on capital. And I suppose that's where I'm also a little bit skeptical about the asset value or the balance sheet targeting because you know, I spend my days trying to, uh, t trying to put a value on assets across various things. And for all the goodwill in the world, if you're trying to do it you know, in the cleanest sense possible, it's very, very tricky. I mean, if the OBR was not um, overseeing the process, I would say absolutely no way in a million years should we be considering it. I think the OBR brings a fantastic um, uh, contribution in, in all aspects of, of our fiscal credibility these days from that external scrutiny and not you know, cooking the books. Um, but even the OBR, with all the best will and not willing to sort of um, cook those books, you know, can they truly um, put put a value on the UK's assets? It's very, very difficult, and you know, bubbles as we've seen in all areas of financial markets so are in real time often explained away. We often say. You know, if, if property prices have gone up, well, that's because you know the UK is suddenly so prosperous; it's at full employment. You know, the the uh, those property prices are sustainable because of something that's going on in the economy. We often find a way of justifying the asset value, uh, and it's very difficult in real time, I think, to either lean against the the wind of that or um, or or to you know not not go with the flow of exuberance about what those asset values are, and therefore whether you can spend on on the back of it, so I'm a little cynical about that. So I, I suppose you know those are some um, overarching uh, concerns. Um, I think it, you know at the end of the day, what are we trying to achieve? I think it's, it's very simple, which is we just don't want debt to be rising forevermore into the forecast horizon. I think we want to be considering a longer forecast horizon. I, I've certainly always been concerned about this fixation with the next one, two, three years when. Um, the OBR's fiscal risks report, which then looks further out and really captures some of the pressures that we've got coming from an ageing population and how debt, you know, <laughs> we just used to look at, pat ourselves on the back for debt coming down and then that fiscal risk report shows that debt's about to disappear off over 200% of GDP when you factor in those demographic challenges. So how do we take a longer term look at um, the fiscal pressures provide some constraint, provide some limit to that envelope, um, I, I think it, it is really challenging, probably is multifaceted. Um, so I do think having element, lots of different elements as Richard has put forward. Um, but I'm skeptical about the, 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 the wealth or the asset value or balance sheet component, I would say. Skepticism is a healthy place to be in life. Thank you very much. <laughs> Chris, over to you, and you can tell us which is your favourite of the five rules you've watched being bust at the end. Of yeah, is it five or is it 17? The question is, is it the individual rule or the framework? That's, that's good, uh, a good question we can have a long debate uh, about down the pub sometime. It's a really good time to be talking about fiscal rules. Um, both parties are clearly thinking about changing them. The Tories are explicitly so, Labour implicitly so. They've not actually, I don't think, mentioned in public their fiscal credibility rule from 2017 for over a year. So there's there's something going on in the Labour Party as well. It's also, it's also very big in academia. Uh, certainly I was in Washington at the IMF meetings only a couple of weeks ago and these sorts of questions are really coming up everywhere. Um, I speak as a bit as a bit of a fiscal nerd. I'm sorry about that. I'm sitting here with an IFS pen I've stolen and a budget 2006 red book. Uh, which is titled A Strong and Strengthening Economy, colon, Investing in Britain's Future. So as you can see, nothing, nothing changes at all. I'll show, there's other things in there which are quite interesting, I think, in the current debate. Uh, I'm going to mention in a bit. I'm also a big supporter of fiscal rules for all the reasons that Richard uh, laid out. I do think they help countries, uh, if they have uh, a deficit bias, to move towards a more prudent fiscal position and they've helped educate in a very broad sense the public about what are sustainable fiscal objectives in a very broad sense. I also think the value of constrained discretion for governments is rather good, both for politicians to make promises they can deliver, so they're not, trying to de they're not promising things they can't deliver, and also for the Treasury to constrain spending departments. So everything Karen just said about what they're actually used for in government I think is entirely correct.
Um, it's also, I think, well, now we're just about to move into the 2020s, a good time to think hard about sets of fiscal rules because, and the institutions that govern them, because in the 2020s things are going to get quite difficult. Population aging is taking hold, health, social care and pensions will rise, probably spending as two percentage points in GDP or so in the last OBR uh, fiscal sustainability report. There's a huge pressure to green the economy, to house people, and there's no acceptance yet of additional taxation. So it's going to be a difficult decade. And I think anyone who thinks it won't be uh, uh, is living in cloud cuckoo land. But where I, where I sort of move apart from where, where Richard, uh, his very good presentation, is that I am quite worried about very technocratic um, fiscal rules. Uh, which uh, can create a bipartisan consensus and be there forever and ever and ever. I'm not worried at all about the number of regimes that have been broken. In fact, I think that is, in some sense, the lifeblood of democracy. Bananas, kippers regulation, uh, these things have been used by politicians, or in fact one senior politician, very extensively to say that external constraints are, are crushing democracy. Uh, what we... And it's essentially nonsense, uh, but it, it would be true to say that if we had rules that were incredibly rigid uh, on taxation and public spending, that is the lifeblood of democracy. And I think we have to worry about constraining it too far at our peril, because if, if the constraints are too great, it will be exploited by oppor opportunistic and cynical politicians. Uh, and instead of people saying it's the EU that stops us, our po us politicians helping you, it'll be it's those fiscal rules I can't change that stops us helping you, or it's the OBR who are in the room here, these these fine people who are stopping us helping you, and that is a really very bad thing I think for sensible politician uh, for sensible democracy and economic policy making and it's not far-fetched you can see it's happening al already around the world look at argentina at the moment for them it's the imf which is stopping them doing uh, the sensible things for the country and it has uh, kicked out the government just at the weekend or in italy right at the moment where a very large debate in italy is about whether the european commission's calculation of the output gap is fair or unfair and that stops them doing what they want to do or in Germany, where you have a long and rather silly debate about whether they should move away from black zero or not. So I think politicians must be responsible and seem to be responsible for the fiscal rules they create. And so, I uh, so my big worry about this report is the sort of the central case is slightly flawed because it allows politicians to evade responsibility for the rules they create. And I want them to be entirely in charge of that and I would I, I will, otherwise I think it potentially politicizes the OBR and that the, the moment that happens it kills the OBRs in my in my uh, in my view because what is the OBR it isn't really anything other than an honest broker for uh, the forecasts uh, and then marking the homework of the government and providing information on the long-term sustainability of the, of the public finances, where they're unconstrained, where they're constrained in the first one because they're the honest broker about marking the homework against the fiscal rules set by the government. And in the second one, they're unconstrained about talking about the long-term sustainability of the public finances. Both of those are enshrined in law, and actually it's whoever wrote the law in 2010-11 did that rather well, I think. Um, so what are fiscal rules? They should be rules of thumb. Uh, they can be broken. If they're broken, the government should, comply, should either comply with them or explain why not, and the, and the OBR should therefore act as an honest broker, marking the homework and free to expound on the sustainability of the public finances in the long term. And I think that as a framework is where we should be. So I'm slightly concerned about going down the slightly more technocratic route. But on the rules, specific rules as proposed in this Resolution Foundation, I'd say there's four. There's, the, there's a public sector net worth rule rising. There's a targeting a cyclically adjusted current spending budget balance, putting that into a surplus five years hence. Uh, a debt interest less than 10% of tax revenues target and an escape clause uh, linked both to the output gap and uh, interest rates. Uh, having written something in two columns, luckily before uh, Resolution Foundation came out with their papers, 
uh, things along the same lines. I'd be, it'd be very churlish of me to say that I don't think, I, I think they're in some ways going down the wrong route. I think they're entirely in the right area. And these are, it's a really good report, uh, which is, uh, has a lot of really good thinking in there and a lot of very good evidence about what we should be thinking about. Just to go through all four, I'll sort of go through them in the order of which I'd like most. Uh, public sector net worth, though, is where I disagree with Karen. I think that's exactly right that to have uh, assets and liabilities uh, to stop fiscal illusions taking hold. It's a very broad concept and it should be there. Our international performance is very poor on this measure even though the measurement in our, in our country is probably better than elsewhere. Uh, we, have, we have a very bad public sector net worth position, essentially through history from privatisations in the 1980s and large deficits in the 90s and 2000s. That's, that's caused our internationally poor uh, position. And it'd be very good if we'd been looking at public sector net worth at the time I'm sure some of the decisions taken then would have been thought would have been a bigger in the pub popular debate about it. It's framed very well, having a five-year target, medium-term expectations of improvement. I think that's entirely the right way of doing it. And it's these sorts of things have worked very well for the one country that has tried it, which is New Zealand, uh, where it's, it's gone down that route and it's, since the mid 1980s, in fact, and it's had a consistently rising public sector net worth since then. The second rule I want to talk about was the interest burden rule. So this is to keep your interest payments uh, less than 10% of tax revenue. I think, again, this is a neat, neat rule. Uh, it's essentially going down the line of what credit rating agencies already do. That's the, what, what they uh, tend to use as their measure of fiscal sustainability. And it allows lower interest rates. It allows you to increase debt if you've got uh, lower interest rates and so it doesn't constrain you in that same way. I don't think it's that different to just increasing the public sector net debt a limit from let's say we're around 80 now to 100 because essentially if you if you just increase the net debt limit on the basis that interest rates were lower that's essentially doing exactly the same thing so we shouldn't suggest this is entirely different and new uh, and we should be aware of one uh, bit of uh, one one aspect of this which might we might end up regressing were we to go down this route which it would give a it give, give governments an incentive to shorten the maturity of uk debt if we had a positively sloping yield curve and that is something that we'd want to guard against in that um, the third rule was the the borrowing rule which is targeting a one percent cyclically, cyclically adjusted budget surplus within five years now in truth, this is exactly the same rule that Labour follows, followed in the uh, period between 1998 and 2008, for, for a decade. It's, what it, it's, it's, the, it's the route that Labour actually followed, not the rule that was actually written down. Um, so if you look at this budget uh, 2006 uh, document, they had a sickly adjusted surplus in the current budget, going from what they thought at the time was a deficit of 1.3% of GDP to a surplus of 0.8% of GDP. So they always, every year, said the next time they will move towards a surplus five years hence in, in, uh, in that rule. And they never made it. So it was always on the never-never. And if, so there is a deficit bias that's built into this rule. Uh, it didn't end happily. Uh, I'm not sure it is a good rule. And the second thing I don't like about this rule is the cyclical adjustment element of it. Uh, we know we have to do that when we put forecasts out, but I don't think we should actually aim to have these in rules because we know they're nonsense. And we know there's a Robin Brooks at the Institute of International Finance at the moment is running a very fun campaign called A Campaign Against Nonsense Output Gaps, or Canoe, go and look it up. It's, it's really... It's, in our in our in our in our world in our very very limited world in this room it is it is good fun um, and um, this was this is also always a problem it's a particular problem in a rule where you have an external body there to assess whether it's met or broken uh, because it puts a huge emphasis on the OBR in our case to actually get the get the cyclical adjustment quotes right, or the European Commission in Italy's case, or in Argentina's case, the IMF, 
and it can really cause a lot of problems because we know we don't know what output gaps are. For example, again, back to the budget 2006 red book, what did you think the output gap was in 2006 as far as the Treasury was concerned at the time? We now think, as, as Richard put up in his slides, that we were running, the economy was running too hot by about 0.3, of GDP. But the contemporary view was we were running too cold. We had 1.5% of uh, GDP we could have had extra growth uh, without creating any inflation or any unsustainability in the economy at the time. And that does cause a problem with all of your slides which have the output gap on, because you haven't used the contemporary output gap, you've used the what we now think the output gap was historically, uh, and that obviously causes a little bit of a, a little bit of a problem in the way it would be, uh, it would have worked in real time. So your 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 escape clause would have been triggered in 2006. You could have done whatever you liked on fiscal policy uh, because we wouldn't have been um, there. So then again, so the escape clause, again, I, I worry about this escape clause having an output gap component because that would put far too much pressure on the OP OBR to do an output gap uh, calculation. I would very much worry that if the, what would happen if the output gap was the OBR declared the output gap to be minus 0.9% of GDP, so Politicians could go around saying it's a disaster. We can't help you because these awful people in the OBR have just declared completely unreasonably that the output gap is 0.9% of GDP rather than 1% of GDP, and therefore uh, that is why uh, we can't uh, increase your benefits or lower your taxes or whatever. And if if only these people weren't there, then we could help you. And that is the end of the OBR, I think. Uh, so, in conclusion, I think fiscal rules should be seen as a, as a rule of thumb. They're very important as a rule of thumb, they're very helpful. The government has to be the people who seem to be setting them, not a bunch of technocrats, uh, and then has to either comply with them or explain why not. There's some very good ideas in this uh, uh, Resolution Foundation document in general, but I do have a problem about the deficit bias in the uh, borrowing rule and the cyclical adjustment element. And what I want the OBR to be in future is both an honest broker and an information provider and not the people who arbitrate what happens to fiscal policy. Great, thank you, Chris. Well, let's, let's start off by picking up some of those issues and then let's get to some, some uh, questions. So let's, let's just go backwards in reverse through some of Chris's um, uh, points and see where we uh, end up. So some of them are reasonably straightforward on so on the current budget rule um, We're not talking about a rolling target. So it's not the same as 2006. It's kind of fixed You've got to actually hit it in that fifth year at all the second year as you get nearer to it So I'm less worried about that but the cyclically adjusted point is a Really serious one where you just got a straight trade-off between the degree to which you want you can either accept somebody else. I mean, what is the truth? The truth is, insofar as I think your phrase was "cook the books," insofar as someone from the treasury in two thousand and six, uh, insofar as that was what was going on, that's obviously what the OBR is for. But it's definitely true that having them estimate the output gap uh, does put pressure on the OBR's role. Although that's also true about their forecast for the economy. Full stop. That's the basis for meeting the rules uh, in lots of ways. So, but it definitely adds an element of uncertainty where somebody, if somebody wanted to politicise the OBR, they could point to the output gap estimate as particularly uncertain compared to all other bits of the forecast, which are all obviously also very uncertain, and say uh, that is um, ridiculous. The, um, uh, and then, do you want to just touch on debt interest and whether we actually can? whether we end up with lots of stupid things in the system, we should just have a higher debt target, which is definitely where lots of the US debate is just heading to, just have higher debt, don't worry about a debt interest target. Yeah, I think it's certainly a straightforward thing to measure by comparison with some of the other things which are more, more new in the world, um, but do exist. I think one thing I'd say about debt limits is that we've had quite a bad history with them as soon as you start to approach them. So if you reset the debt target to 100, and then you say, right, we're gonna borrow up to 99, which has been what governments tended to do. Once you get the wrong side of a debt target, it basically becomes irrelevant because you've got momentum behind debt growing and it, and it takes 10 years to a decade to get it to come down again. I mean, just look at the success. We've had a successive, successive government since 2010 have promised to get debt falling and it only started doing it two years ago. And we had eight years of government saying we're going to get debt down and it doesn't happen. Targeting a stock, um, which once it starts going up, it tends to keep going up, it, is, it means it's very difficult to actually use it as a guide for day-to-day -day policymaking. I think this target adjusts more gradually because 
higher interest rates or debt shocks only filter through to the cost of debt over time um, and make it make it more manageable. Now, on Karen's uh, excellent point, which is, it's hard enough doing the OBR's job and all this other stuff already. Do you seriously want the OBR having to calculate the in or assess the calculation of the entire asset side of the state? Mm. That is a fair question. That is hard. People in the OBR are looking sweaty just thinking about it. Uh, in the audience, uh, Richard, defend your ludicrous. How are we going to calculate all this stuff? It would, it would certainly be a new challenge for the OBR. But, I mean, they already, they already cost lots of other kinds of policies which are quite complicated to understand, universal credit being one of them, um, which have... That's lots gone of, really well. Cut. Which have lots of, I mean, they, but in the end, this is, this is fiscal policy making in practice. I think the other thing I'd say is that, I mean, there are standards and bases for valuing these things similar to the ones used in the private sector. So there are independent standards uh, for asset valuation which governments already use to produce their accounts. And I guess the third thing is that I mean, this is what politicians are promising, right? And so we either hold them to account for what they're promising and say, you promised us a brand new rail, a brand new rail system with this value, which is going to be bigger than the cost of, that, we're, uh, that we're incurring to finance it, or we're just going to sort of take them at their word. And I'd rather have a system which forces them to actually show that the value of the assets is bigger than their cost of financing than just to assume that, exclude the whole thing from the framework and hope for the best. Um, so I completely agree when I think through the micro-specific projects. As you say, it should be, uh, if we're thinking about a specific railway city extension, um, having to do that cost-benefit analysis on that project makes perfect sense. It's more about the entirety of the balance sheet and then particularly how optimism, exuberance can get built into those estimates of the of current stock of physical assets. I think that's the real challenge. So building it in in a in a micro manner, um, much as I guess the, the Treasury does on most of the projects it's evaluating on a daily basis, but, but that, that I completely buy. It's the total stock I'm a little more cynical on. Should we try another critique of ourselves, given that, and you guys kind of both got at this, which is just, these are complex. This is like, as you say, four, we've got four rules. Um, you've got to be quite keen to know exactly what they mean. Now, it was always obviously nonsense that the public understood the fiscal rules. Like, it was, like, that was never a thing, even though we slightly on occasion in the early, late 90s, some economists and policymakers did talk a bit about, but you know, that you'd have to be a really, really weird human being outside of this room to really know what the fiscal rules meant. So, but maybe this is just like overreach into, it's just so complicated that not even the kind of economists who are kind of following this can follow it, so it's not providing any constraint. I mean, I, I, in the end, I don't think it's any more complicated than trying to forecast tax revenue, which we don't. We tend to not, not get right all the time, or forecast spending. Um, and again, any business has to value its assets and liabilities and produces a balance sheet. It's just that government has lagged about a century behind in its accounting practices for kind of for historic reasons that it that it doesn't do it. I think we're we're, we're lucky in the UK that we have uh, people at the ONS, um, some of whom are here today who actually put together this kind of data, and not just on an annual basis, but actually with a kind of high frequency basis that you can start to use for forecasting and monitoring. So I, I, don't, think it's as, I don't think it's as abstract or as academic a proposition as it, as it was five or 10 years ago. Um, today, there's been a lot of investment actually put into the, produce, put the, pro the production of quite high quality, high frequency balance sheet data, which, um, and again, we're not targeting a specific value for this thing. We're just saying it should be going up over time. And that also seems to me a kind of intuitive proposition that the net worth of the of the institution that you're running um, as chief financial officer should should be going up rather than going down. Radical idea, um, Chris. On your so in your kind of day job, if you had a net worth rule, would it make it any easier to stop either bad privatizations? So by by bad I mean cheap here, rather than whether you think they're better, like selling stuff cheap, or, or bad nationalizations, buying stuff too expensive, or running it badly. Or would it still be impossible because no one could measure this stuff? No, I think it would make it a lot, a lot easier actually. I think the, the there was literally no traction since 2010 to the hey look, student loans are all going to be half of them are going to be written off in 30 years' time. Maybe this doesn't solve save as much money to the public finances uh, as we thought until uh, was it the 2018 OBR fiscal sustainability report which highlighted the fiscal illusions very, very clearly and showed there was 10 to 15 billion pounds worth of them. I, certainly my day job, I had tried to say, write, write a piece on this, but there was literally no information, so it was impossible and we didn't in the end. Uh, and frankly, it was very hard uh, 
to get out of the tragedy what the rules were. So I think those sorts of issues are much, much better where you've got assets and liabilities together and it would be very helpful for a better debate on nationalisation and privatisation, uh, which are going to clearly be part of the lifeblood of our democracy in the next few weeks even, uh, to know that uh, it doesn't cost us £200 billion to nationalise the water industry or whatever the CBI said, but it might still be a really dumb idea to do that. Uh, and then you can actually have a debate about whether it's a good idea or a dumb idea, rather than does it cost £200 billion quid. Sounds good. Right, let's get some questions on you guys. I think there are some mics roving. There's a hand up here, Jack. Anyone else while you move? Uh, Charlie Bean, uh, LSE and OBR and Chief Output Gap Forecaster. In, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I've got a couple of remarks. Um, the first and more minor one uh, is uh, you, you, you started by saying that what gets excluded gets exploited, which is clearly true. Um, but I don't think it's the case that simply moving to a more comprehensive uh, view of the uh, public sector balance sheet solves the problem. It just relocates it in how the illiquid assets uh, are valued. And that will become the area that um, uh, where there's the jiggery-pokery taking place. So the, the question of how you... Uh, police them or monitor uh, a thing, it it's remains important. The more substantive thing relates to the, the rules themselves. Now, in general, I should say I'm um, very much supportive of the, uh, the direction in which you've gone. I've always favoured looking at a comprehensive balance sheet. I wrote a paper with Bill and Boughton nearly 40 years ago saying we needed a more comprehensive uh, view, and I certainly take the view that the cost-benefit uh, analysis of monetary policy vis-a-vis -vis fiscal policy has shifted in the direction of needing more activist fiscal policy in a world of low natural real interest rates. Uh, and the rules that you've uh, put forward are obviously designed to make it uh, more possible to use fiscal policy as a counter-cyclical weapon. And I think that's the, the right way to go. Um, but I think it's also important to think how these rules might go wrong. Um, and I was quite pleased to see you doing the sort of simulations at the end of different shocks. Um, you have to remember that the rules, are, a, a good set of rules would be rules that give you uh, room to take the right sorts of counter-cyclical policies and the right intertemporal borrowing decisions, but try and prevent bad behaviour, misbehaviour. And the question is, are your rules going to achieve that? Uh, first of all, as regards net worth, and this is a, 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 an issue that Karen touched on, um, th the parallel with private businesses is not really right here, because there's quite a lot of public sector capital which doesn't generate revenues, uh, you know, it generates social returns. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, but it's not an asset that you can necessarily sell back to the, sell into the market or something like that. And governments are in danger of conning themselves when they say borrowing to invest is all right, um, because they may be building up an asset which, if there's uh, financing difficulties, can't be sold or anything like that. Then I want to put that together with the debt servicing um, uh, rule, which says when interest rates are low, it's fine to borrow lots. And as Chris correctly observed, that also encourages you to borrow short. Now just think about that for a moment. You've got a set of fiscal rules which says, hey guys, it's fine to borrow lots and lots and, uh, of short maturity because interest rates are really low and invest it all in assets that are illiquid of very uncertain and dubious returns. Now, as somebody who sat through the financial crisis and the Eurozone debt crisis, that fills me with horror, I have to say. Now, this might not be something that's an issue for the next few years, but it, it potentially uh, is a toxic combination. So I, if you went this way, you would certainly need things that require the maturity structure not to be 
shorten too much. We might well want some other things too. Great, thank you, Charlie. Anyone else want to come in? There's a gentleman at the back there. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Moyn Islam. I'm a fixed income strategist at Barclays. Um, just a couple of observations, which is firstly, as to Charlie's point about uh, the term structure, I think you kind of, have, for someone like me who's within the market, you're kind of missing the point that the issuance of government debt is not really a function of what the government wants, it's what the private sector demands. <coughs> and uh, the term structure of UK debt is really a function of historic pension like historic private sector pension liabilities, not because the government was so wise as to lengthen our debt before the financial crisis. Secondly, your 10%, and it stems from it, the 10, this 10% 10 kind of debt interest to revenue rule, uh, and it's, it's pretty convenient, frankly, uh, because we have a long-term structure and a low debt interest kind of structure. So how's that going to change? And you're seeing it already in as much that the debt management office is going shorter on the curve. Um, the if you look at the term structure of gilt forwards relative to swap forwards, for example, the gilt curve is considerably steeper uh, than the swap curve. Uh, you talk about fiscal credibility. I mean, I've kind of made this point to you in the past, Richard, but there are plenty of indicators which suggest that the UK is kind of burning fiscal credibility at a rate of knots already. Uh, and you kind of assuming within this entire framework that the UK can kind of do what it wants. And I would contend that maybe you actually can't do what you want okay, anymore. Great question. Right, then let's, let's take those two because they're covering... A, a, Can I put a question back to that one? Put a question back to him. Yeah. There. Go on then. Wh why is the UK burning through fiscal credibility with a guilt yield of 0.7? You're looking in the wrong place. Literally, you're looking in the wrong place. Well, okay, I would throw that Five back sterling. and say, why is the 10 to 30s asset swap box, so the relative measure of 30-year spreads versus 10-year spreads, at 43 basis points? Okay. Whereas the relative slope of the OIS curve in 10 to 30s is like right. 13 That's basis definitely points. definitely detail. Great. <laughs> the, uh, right now, okay. Let's just because let, let's make sure this is comprehensible for the wider for everyone in the room. Okay. So the um, so the underlying argument here. Let's, let's, let's unpick this into a number of things. So the first is focusing on the debt debt interest today, as if we're forecasting it today, gives you some incentives which we don't like on uh, the term of your debt, which is definitely true. So in the weeds of this, you would definitely need other things to push against uh, that. The, um, there's then a separate issue which is. If things, which is kind of again, which is if things go wrong, and your debt servicing costs don't stay low, uh, have you by setting this like ten percent target built yourself into failure because you can't turn it around quick enough when the pain starts to come through? Particularly if you've borrowed short, so that the transformation from uh, market rates changing into the overall cost of your debt is quick, which we spent a lot of time in this thinking about. Oh, I'd say one thing I would say on this is on our. Like in some ways, you know, when we've thought about debt rules in the past, we've been aiming for these point targets. So we've been saying, like, pre-crisis, we're aiming for this 40% and we're going to keep it there. Obviously, kind of totally missing that what happens when you blow it up. is It's kind of it's interesting that you wanted to be at 40, but you're now at 80. The, um, it doesn't tell you very much about what you then do. Here, we're really saying is 10% we, we, is more of like an absolute limit. I, if you see yourself going anywhere near it, that's the point at which we think societies start to say we're not going to pay that. Um, so you're wanting, to be, you're wanting to be looking ahead to say, am I ever going to get near that? Which gets towards your question. But Richard, go on. on. On it's all too loose. The country's a basket case. Rates will soar at some point, and then you'll be gone. I, didn't say that. I know, I know. I know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I know. You know, it's really early in the morning. We're talking about fiscal policy, so we're kind of, you know, trying to liven it up a bit. <laughs> I guess I'd, say, I guess I'd say two things. One is that the incentive to short maturity has always been there because it's always been cheaper at the short end of the yield curve than the long end. And uh, despite that fact, the UK has consistently lengthened the maturity of its debt. Um, so I think that incentive has always been there. I'm not sure this framework makes it any stronger or weaker. Um, maybe a little bit because it gets you a bit more headroom against one rule where you've already got a lot of headroom. Um, so uh, perhaps, but I think that's really at the margins. And the other, and, and the other thing to say is that this, what that would do is make your debt interest revenue ratio much more sensitive to changes in the interest rate, which if you're even a vaguely enlightened fiscal planner sitting in the Treasury, you should be thinking about and conscious of. And people, yeah. do, people do think about these things. Um, and, so, and the other thing to say is that if there is suddenly a step change in interest rates and they go back up to levels that they were in 2008, well, that's an even bigger problem if you have a debt to, re a debt to GDP ratio target, right? It's because you suddenly decided that having 100 or, or 150 debt to GDP ratio is the right number, but that's based on interest rates staying, staying at below 1%. If they go back up to 4, that's definitely going to be the wrong number. The rule that we've got in here actually makes sure that you take that into account when trying to set fiscal policy. And does it, does it, is it too late? We've talked about, it's about the speed of adjustment. 
i.e. Once, once, so the news turns up, rates are now four, not for our new borrowing are now four. Can we turn it around quick enough on our five-year forecast to stop going over 10% and being bust? I mean, in practice, you're always turning it around over a five-year forecast. And actually, in practice, you're turning it around over 10 years, as we've seen with, with the debt stock to, with, with the debt to GDP ratio. So uh, the speed limit on our pace of adjustment is kind of you know, our, our political constraints and practical constraints on how quickly you can change policy settings without making whatever economic problems you have worse. So I think this is a better reflection of, of the actual speed at which governments can adjust this quarter. Okay, and then to make sure this isn't all for Richard, so um, Chris, you've been supportive of net worth as an approach. Charlie's kind of right, joining in with Karen on the, you're going to ask us, you're going to say to people they can buy all this stuff. It is either illiquid, and so it doesn't really matter what the value is because you can't get rid of it if you're in real trouble, or we can't really measure it very well. And so are you sure you're not just giving a green light to buying wrong stuff? Yeah, so if you were to borrow short to buy stuff you can't sell, a lot of it, then that's obviously putting yourself in a difficult position, and I totally accept that. And so I would suggest that it, if we are going to increase debt, this is why I actually prefer to keep a debt rather than a debt interest target, although loosening it slightly, if we are to increase debt to buy stuff, you also have rules where governments have to say exactly what they want to achieve and why it increases output, uh, and then be and then get the OBR to measure the value of that. So you make it a very economic decision, yeah. and it, and that would mean the additional borrowing is essentially going down. Of course, money's fungible. I do understand that, uh, uh, but, uh, but it means the additional borrowing is going to be much more on the sort of type of infrastructure and other really clearly economic assets or secondary, maybe climate change uh, related uh, uh, infrastructure as well. Although a lot of that could be done, I would have thought, in the private sector. And, and of course, the other thing is that, that all of these rules can be gamed. And I just remember the debt rule in the, again, in the, in the Gordon Brown period, where they had two ways of subsidising the rail industry. They could either give capital grants to Network Rail or they could give money actually to the TOX for the operations and they always went through, went through capital grants because it was easier because of the current budget rule. Uh, it was much better to structure it in that way and Treaty Vadero was a past master at uh, making sure that things were done in the right way. So we always have to be careful. And, that, and so the big bulwark against that is the second aspect of the OBR's role, which is the unconstrained ability to talk about the sustainability of the public finances. And even though the fiscal risk reports and the fiscal sustainability reports might not be the most read documents in the country, what? they're very important. Mm. And they are actually the things where the OBR can highlight problems or highlight aspects of what government might be doing and where it's being a little bit naughty in gaming the rules and do that in an unconstrained way and that that, that is actually a very very effective bulwark i think ultimately and so for example what's happened over the past two years on student loans it wouldn't have happened had it not been highlighted by the OBL. okay great let's get some more questions anyone's got thoughts let's do here let's put these two together come on to francis off you go andy Thanks. Uh, so, Andy King, OBR, but this is not an OBR question. I just wondered, within your three rules, how does the Treasury set a spending envelope? Because the change in PSNW is, you know, collapses into being uh, a current surplus. And then the debt interest one, you're miles and miles from the uh, limit. So how does the Treasury actually decide what is the maximum on the cap size on of cap team? On the capital envelope, you mean? Exactly, yes. yes. OK, great question. Francis? Francis Coppola, um, financial writer and generally annoying person. Um, <laughs> I really like balance sheets, so I'm very glad to see the net worth coming into this because it's annoyed me for years. But I have a couple of questions about it. The first is that it strikes me, sort of party of Charlie here, um, we are actually hitting some of the same problems as the private sector hits when it's attempting to assess a very large and really very compl complex balance sheet. And there are two parts of that. First is valuation of intangible assets um, and the framework for doing that. I know the OBR has covered this to some extent, but it seems to me that if you're actually going to make this part of your um, fiscal rule setting, you've got to be very much more rigorous about it. And my second is actually about the boundary of the public sector. And I wanted to bring one particular example of this which was the treatment of housing associations, which came onto the balance sheet and then were removed from it again 
And it seems to me there's a little bit of an opportunity there for uh, politicians, not politicising the OBR, of course, to, um, shall we say, adjust what is on and off balance sheet to flatter their figures, which is, of course, something we see public se private sector companies doing. Um, but it seems to me we could easily get okay. the public sector doing it too. Great. That's a great question. Right. So Andy's got a really practical question on how do you... In the, at the moment, for some, to some, a pretty heavy degree, your spending envelope can fall out of your uh, fiscal rules on your overall spending, whereas our rule makes that easier on current but doesn't do it in a simplistic way on capital. It is. I mean, it, it, would be, it would be quite similar to the way it was done when Labour had a golden rule, which is that there was a clear envelope set for current spending, which was uh, achieving a, a current balance over the cycle. Um, on the capital side, it came down to how much you, how much you wanted to invest um, because there wasn't really a limit on capital spending apart from a, a debt ceiling, which was quite far away. Um, I think for the moment, that's probably the right calculation for government. Um, it, you know, there, are, there are a lot of cha investment challenges out there, which given, governments, uh, given government, the financing environment for government at the moment, it should be thinking about whether it wants to meet. Um, the, de the debt interest constraint could well become a constraint in the future if interest rates go up. Um, but, but for the moment, there is an opportunity to try and invest in things like getting growth going, tackling climate change and these sorts of things. So part of the envelope um, is, is not so much a question for the Treasury, but a question for departments about can you bring forward investment propositions which actually can be demonstrated to improve our net worth over time and help to meet that, that second objective. So uh, the question of the envelope partly comes back to you know, what are the opportunities out there, not just, not just what is a constraint. Okay. On this, on this, on um, Francis's point, which is... I don't know, Chris, what you think, but so you've covered ad, ad nauseum both the so the classification you're talking about, housing associations, was an ONS decision, but clearly government can set policy to influence the ONS's decision. So do you, do you think, Chris, we don't actually get rid of any of the boundary? Just becomes the issue rather than the whether you're on the assets and liability side of the. I mean, if we're talking, if we're talking, you know, get down to basics. The real the real boundary problem here is that the ONS has a binary is either on or off rather than a mixed function, which would be much, much better. But uh, let's, let's just leave it where we are, where the ONS will, will, has a binary yes or no. Actually, if you have a balance sheet, it makes it, I would say, a lot uh, less advantageous to get it off balance sheet because you're getting the assets off as well. So currently with housing associations or in the big network rail on or off, it was that the debt was on, uh, but the assets were off. And this time it'd be, you'd be moving both debt and assets off. Yeah. And so it's actually a much smaller decision now and a lot less of an incentive to shift it off than it was before. Actually, there's a wider point there which we should just pick up on the volatility. Because I think a good critique of this is it's quite hard to measure these balance sheets. So when you accidentally get a very volatile thing you're trying to target when things like that happen, whereas our view is... I mean, I think the, the traditional thinking on the balance sheet is that it is more volatile than debt because it includes lots of items which are subject to changes in discount rates and other factors. Um, when we actually looked at the data, it turns out that net worth is less volatile than debt um, for reasons which, reason. once you think about it, are also intuitive, which is that discount factors, discount rates affect both assets and liabilities, uh, and you get offsetting effects on either side of the balance sheet. Um, and it's certainly the case that the incentives to move things off balance sheet are, are, are much less when you're losing both the assets and the liabilities, as opposed to in the past, the temptation has always been to get things off because, you, because you're just trying to get measured levels of debt down. I think, and just on, this, on the questions people are raising about valuations, it's definitely a challenge within this framework, and it's something new which we would have to contend with within our fiscal rules. But it is the same set of issues, as Francis said, that every company grapples with every day when they produce their accounts. And... There are a whole set of issues there, and you know, there's, and there's some very good work being done within government at the moment about the valuation of government's intangible assets. Because for a major uh, private company nowadays, in the kind of uh, sort of FTSE 500, these companies have got 50, 80 percent of their value is in the form of intangible assets. When you look at government, we've only got about five percent of our value measured as intangible assets, and that's a sort of artifact of the fact that governments just don't think in balance sheet terms. It can't be the case that only five percent of our assets are, inta are intangible. We've got data, we've got R and D, we've got, we've got proprietary technology. Um, all those things must be worth more than they are than we, than we think they are. By actually looking at the balance sheet, it actually starts governments asking interesting questions about what value these things have, both for the delivery of public services, but also potentially do they have commercial potential um, that you can use. You want us to start borrowing against the NHS brand? Uh, well, not necessarily, but slight, slightly joking, but on the edge. One day, one day we'll get there. Uh, fine. Right, Karen, come in and then we'll wrap up on two other questions. I think this is just, this is getting me thinking, which is... A good that's, thing, that's what we're here for. That's the purpose of the morning. Um, 
And although I still am very much against the sort of whole net wealth, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about this in the current conjecture of where we are with very little monetary ammunition should we face a downturn and increasing use of fiscal balance sheets, fiscal policy in order to uh, drive the economy forward, particularly in a downturn. So I'm thinking about a basic example where, you know, we have a, a horrendous Brexit outcome, a key manufacturing sector going through a very difficult time and a sort of government's assessment that we need to uh, support an industry um, through... Uh, th to retain those jobs, retain that industry as the economy goes through these difficult times. So that would be a, an acquisition a, um, for strategic growth purposes. And I think this kind of discussion and this analysis of making sure that, that the you know, assets are being acquired at appropriate valuations, that you know, decisions are being made appropriately is, is absolutely something we need to be having. We need to have the framework in place. I do think it's on a micro project, transparent basis. Um, so I, I sort of just wanted to clarify as my thoughts were evolved that it's, it's not necessarily the, the, the aspect I think we should very much be thinking in that way, but I'm not sure the yeah. conducting a rule around it, yeah. it's more about the, the um, information, credibility, transparency. Yeah. And there's clearly a kind of hybrid of what we're talking about, which is, look, stick to your debt rule because people understand it, and then have a kind of marginal balance sheet. So like yeah. the things you say you're going to do each year, you're the, I do think then you've got you know, all of the problems about kind of not looking after your assets once you've got them, how you run them, mm. do then you lose any benefit on those things. You can basically, you're basically publishing your kind of cost benefit analysis of big stuff you do through the balance sheet. Yeah. That's not, that would be a good thing to do, um, but you won't get all the wider benefits from a uh, subject to the traumas of doing that. Right, let's just wrap up on two issues because we've got five minutes left. So the first is to say is climate change, which we haven't really talked about here, but one of the motivations for this is, yes, we're all talking about um, uh, big increase in uh, borrowing to invest, either for the labour side on nationalisations and on capital uh, spending, or in the conservative side, basically on infrastructure, transport largely, but housing presumably at some point when Sergio Java gets to announce a budget one day, if he does. Um, uh, so everyone wants to do it, but there's another thing out there which is at some point the state and the private sector is going to have to spend some money on actually getting the country ready for the depressing new world we face. Do these rules allow us to do that? Do they allow us to do too much of that? Is it particularly impossible to measure the value of investments that are climate change focused rather than building a road? I think they certainly facilitate those kind of decisions and I think also encourage government to think in those terms because a lot of the kind of expenditure you need to do to tackle climate change is investment, be it in technology, um, research and development, all of which counts as assets um, in the sense that it creates knowledge, um, or in actual physical assets if you're building flood defences, um, that is what you need. But I think it also forces you to think on the other side of the balance sheet about you know, potentially what assets are you impairing um, because of climate change, um, are rising sea levels, meaning that your transport infrastructure is more vulnerable. These are decisions that corporations are now confronting and having to think about. Um, government should be doing the same. If we are building infrastructure um, in floodplains um, or if we are building infrastructure which, where the configuration will need to change because of climate change, we need to understand what that means for our assets. Um, but also we need to think about what new assets we can create to actually help mitigate it. And this is a framework which actually allows you to do that. Chris? I, I, mean, I think those are the easy cases. A hard case would be changing all of our domestic boilers from gas to electricity, because we get nothing for that. We could still heat, heat our houses in exactly the same way, uh, no improvement in our quality of life, but we're not using a fossil fuel, assuming the electricity comes well, An improvement in our life just in the long term. Yeah, so we're taking, we're, well, we're, we're, Whole not sea levels we're, rising. we're lowering, potentially lowering future catastrophic risk. Exactly, yeah. Uh, for a cost now, which would be on the balance sheet. Yeah. Uh, we couldn't sell, at Charlie's point, we couldn't sell these electric boilers in any meaningful way into the market. And we probably um, shouldn't sell the old gas boilers. And we shouldn't sell the old ga gas boilers. So that is something which is then a big political decision we have to take as a country about something, we, whether we want to incur debt, either privately or publicly, to do this. Uh, and that's the decision we have to take regardless of the fiscal rules we, we have. And that is therefore something for politics and not for fiscal rules, I'd say. But the, uh, uh, just on your, fiscal rules on your distinction, on your happening. setting. So for fiscal rules exactly. mustn't be the thing that prevents us doing that. Exactly. Uh, but it's a political decision that decides whether we take it or not. Yeah. Okay. Karen, climate change? Anything you want to add? Or? Um, no, nothing sort of specific. I mean, uh, the, the, your point you just made, Chris, to me actually is just one of the things I've been 
mulling over through this whole conversation is um, ultimately what level of debt do we care about is largely a decision about an intergenerational de decision that we're making these days. So that that final comment that you've just made there on it's a political decision about prioritising the future um, or at least changing the balance of consideration of future generations to today. Um, that absolutely relates to climate change, but in my mind, actually, it's the biggest challenge we have right now in creating fiscal rules is what level of debt is appropriate. And that comes down to that intergenerate, shifting that intergenerational balance to you know, a more of a concern about the burden that our current generations and our children face rather than, than today. I think it, it fits you know, very neatly into the, the overall problem. Okay. Now, let's wrap up on, because um, as we started where we started, which is there's probably an election coming, who knows, maybe not tonight to be called, but at some point this week probably. Um, what should fiscal policy be doing now in that world, and is uh, and, uh, and uh, which, how do these rules relate to that question? Let's just break that down into like what should be happening on the capital side and what is going on current. And the reason that matters is because you're probably going into election which is different from the previous elections we've had, which is one party, both parties saying we want more spending on public services, one saying on top of that we want more capital spending and more tax cuts, the Conservative Party, and one party saying if they repeat their 2017 approach, so they're a party saying we're going to tax rises to fund our current spending increases. So on the current side, Labour currently is heading towards a tighter fiscal policy than the Conservatives, irony of ironies, uh, while saying we want incredibly large increases in capital spending, both to nationalise stuff and then also to spread wealth around the country and other things. So what should fiscal policy be doing, Richard? Um, well, I think on the capital side, the cost of financing is much lower than it was uh, a few years ago. and. It, I think the challenges and the need for investment is, is greater as we learn more about climate change, as we continue to experience sluggish growth, which the private sector is not managing to solve for us. I think there is more of a role for government to invest, to try and to, and to take advantage of the environment that we have to try and tackle some of those challenges. I think on the capital side, the answer is invest more, but do so in a transparent way. I think on the current side, the right answer is keep your powder dry and, and wait to see what's coming next, because I think we are in a period of considerable uncertainty, some of which we've created for ourselves, but a lot of which has actually been created by the outside environment. I think trying to take a punt now on a big on a big expansion of current spending or a big ta or a big uh, cut in taxes um, or going the other way um, would be to, to, I think, to be taking a risk in, in one direction where actually the economy can go in two very different directions. Great. Karen? Um, you a tax cutter or a tax riser? <laughs> God, that's a tough one. Um, well, I think, I think we have to somehow, somehow, somehow in, increase the horizon of the conversations that we're having. We have to factor in that we have a, an ageing population, we have very rapidly um, increasing costs for we, how are we ever going to fix social care in the, the NHS? How are we ever going to not have a winter where NHS in crisis is not all over rolling BBC News? Um, how do we bring that d enormous problem that we have in the UK into our, you know, a true debate about what we can afford and the choices that we, we face? I think that to me is the, the biggest political challenge that we have of you know the, the the, the spending over the next 30 years, there's a lot of predictability on that looking pretty horrific. How do we have an honest conversation about the realities of some of the decisions we have to make? And unfortunately, I think that puts us in a much closer to a tax rise. A tax. A tax. <laughs> that is definitely a tax riser's answer. <laughs> you can, Chris, you're a tax riser, aren't you? Um, Definitely a tax right. So on capital, I think it's, you know, there's the question of what. So it's easy on things like housing, where there's a financial return, and it could, it could actually be probably done in the private sector, although quite difficult to do. On the, uh, then you've got sort of transport and other infrastructure, and then sort of climate change things, which I think we, whatever's going to happen, we are going to have more borrowing for capital projects uh, in the next government. On the current side, I am I think are def definitely a tax riser and I would want to run, so, so long as you can for cyclical reasons, a tighter current budget than I would want to run, run a current surplus or current balance uh, in all, quotes normal times on the grounds that it's quite an easy fiscal rule to explain to the people that our generation is paying its own way. We're willing to borrow to help you in the future, but we're not going to uh, we're not going to borrow for the stuff we're doing today. And I think that's a relatively straightforward rule of thumb, which if you, you really hit it or if you don't hit it, you explain why not. That sounds like good to me. I mean, there is one just to wrap up on that. The, uh, there is a 
you know, what, what, if you went to the 1990s and all the original fiscal rules literature about why it was a good idea, like we, are, we may be about to live through the classic case of the deficit bias of you know, a Conservative Party having spent nine years getting the deficit down and then deciding that Doesn't matter. it currently <laughs> has no fiscal rules at all, basically. Um, you, you put it more politely in your slides, which is very sensible. But the truth is, the country has no fiscal framework at the moment, uh, which is why people are promising stuff all over the shop. The, um, and that is not a good place to be, even if you're not a total fiscal nut. Right, uh, can we uh, thank the panel for their thoughts today? Have a good day as taxpayers and spenders, because quite a lot of civil servants in the room. And remember, it's good to know uh, what you owe, not just what you borrow to pay for it.